वेलकम टू डॉक्टर मुसरत हसन साहब फ्रॉम कराची आई वुड नॉट गिव द गेस्टेशनल एज ऑन दिस इमेज बिकॉज द शेप इज ऑफ आई विल नॉट गिव द गेस्टेशनल एज बिकॉज द शेप इज ऑफ आई विल नॉट गिव द गेस्टेशनल एज ऑन दिस बीपीडी बिकॉज द शेप इज स्ट्रॉबेरी and that does not fall between 74 and 73 and 84 and this is again another example i do not give the gestational age because i get the wrong gestational age because the bp is not reliable because the cephalic index is off and that's another head which i call it as a butterfly sign i will never give the gestational age with the bp what about hc no matter how you mold the head from here or here the circumference remains the same that's why in microcephaly i think that is dolico brachio you do the head circumference and check whether the cephalic index is normal and can that be given for bpd gestational age So HC formula is BPD plus OFD occipital frontal diameter divided by two multiplied by pi will give you a number. So head circumference can be calculated, and I'm putting on the color film over here. And HC formula is whatever the gestational age minus two is the head circumference. Puri kainaka vajud is based on reflection. ye kyunki we are in the city of saints and this is a very important statement and why i remember this because when i was doing this research when i was coming up with these formulas i did not know that i was focusing on gestational age i got another information that means gestational age minus 2 is head circumference head circumference plus 2 is gestational that's reflection think about it when you go back home there is no calvarium and when there is no calvarium we rely on femur length because we cannot give the gestational age so we rely on the femur length femur length within normal limits is small or large we are dealing with skeletal dysplasia a convergences or going of the long bones and so on and so forth femur length formula is very simple that is whatever the femur length add two to it which becomes bpd and bpd multiplied by 4 will give you the gestational age so whatever is the bpd minus 2 should be the femur length and whatever the femur length plus 2 should be the bpd multiplied by 4 very easy way to know whether the head is big or the femur is small or femur is big or head is small and that if correlates with each other we are dealing with a normal fetus so here is a femur and we know how to measure it i'm not going to that now we have the most important slide and that is how to interpret different readings if the bpd is 9 the femur should have been 7 because i just said minus 2 instead the femur is coming 6 now what is your reference point is it the femur your reference point is it the bpd your reference point if you know the lmp if you have a previous ultrasound done in the at the level of crown dump plan then it becomes very easy if no ultrasound was done lmp is not known then it's a very difficult situation and that is why you need a very serial ultrasound done in such patients if the difference is less than 0.5 on either side we take it normal if it is more than 0.5 it's plus 1 standard deviation and more than 1 cm on either side is plus 2 standard deviation what does that mean to us one standard deviation means you need a follow up 
if it's more than two standard deviation, we are dealing with a problem. So here is the practical. Here is the femur length and here is the head. So according to LMP, it is corresponding to the femur length. The head is small. You do the head circumference, you do the BPD. It does not correspond with the femur length. That means we are dealing with microcephaly. This is the other way around. The head is big. The femur is small. More than two standard deviation. We don't have to wait because it's more than two. You measure everything five times. What was my first slide? What gets measured gets improved. If you measure everything many times, it will give you a message which I cannot teach. So you will learn something during measurements which nobody can teach. So measure as many times and measure many things at that time when you're doing the pregnancy scan. What about femur and uterus length formula? Uterus is one centimeter shorter than femur. If you got one centimeter shorter, make sure are you dealing with femur or you're dealing with uterus? That would be very easy. So look for the urinary bladder and then say, oh, no, no, I'm, I'm in the femur and that femur and uterus one centimeter less and that's what the diagnosis is. What about abdominal circumference formula? Within normal limits, small or large. Why are we are doing this? To exclude IUGR, organomegaly, macrosomic and so on and so forth. And I'm not going to read each and everything, but you can go ahead very fast. Abdominal circumference, again the same formula as head circumference, a plus B divided by 2 multiplied by 5, which is 22.7. But if you are appearing for the ultrasound exam, this is important. If you are not appearing for the exam, it's not important because your ultrasound machine calculates everything for you and gives you the answer right away. When you take the abdominal circumference, where you take the abdominal circumference is either a small stomach and I mean small stomach, or if the stomach is empty, because it empties every half an hour to 45 minutes, it fills in every half an hour to 45 minutes. So when you did the ultrasound, there was no stomach. That does not mean that there is no stomach. But we look at the J-shaped configuration of the flycal wing with that of the flycal <coughs> wing. If you see a beautiful J, that's the correct place to take the abdominal circumference. So I'll remove this color, and that's a J. Beautiful J, beautiful J, and right behind the J is the stomach. So don't look for the stomach on this side, where the bend of the J at the back of it, look for the stomach, and that's where you look for the stomach. If you find the stomach, that means no esophageal atresia or there's no pyloric stenosis and so on and so forth. What is the AC formula once you've got a very good view of that abdominal circumference? Whatever the gestational age minus 5 is abdominal circumference and it works the other way around as well. So 34 weeks minus 5 is 29 AC and when you've got 29 AC plus 5 the weeks. This formula will not work if there is an abnormality in the fetal abdomen, like large kidney, polycystic kidney, meconium uh, cyst, or dilated bowels, this will go off. But you do pick up on B mode, there is a problem. When you see a cyst in the lower abdomen of the fetus, when you see a cyst in the lower abdomen of the fetus, this is. Uh, Megacystis. This is abnormal. This fetus needs to be aborted. You don't need time. I'll wait and see if it becomes all right. No. This is megacystis, which is underlying chromosomal abnormality. <coughs> if you see the same cyst at 20 weeks, it's not megacystis. So it must differentiate less than 14 weeks or more than 14 weeks. Abdominal circumference ratio 
at CAC ratio is 1 at 36 weeks plus minus 10 days. Why? Because we want to diagnose IUGR on that basis. So you take the two images side by side, the head circumference and the body circumference, and then correlate that if it is 34 XC, 34 AC, 34 divided by 34 becomes 1, plus minus 10 days. AC weight formula is very simple from 20 to 25 abdominal circumference. Minus 10, put a dot, becomes the weight of the baby. On the screen you are making the diagnosis. Why are you doing this on the screen? If you took the images and sent the patient out, wait, I'll give you the report in the evening, and the patient went away, oh, there was a discrepancy, call the patient again, you wasted your time and you wasted patient's time. If you know these formulas on the screen, you can sort the problem right there and then. Now, we have this beautiful slide. The top orange one is the abdominal circumference and lower one is the gestational age. Keep on increasing one centimeters, keep on decreasing one centimeters and keep on decreasing 0.2 kg, 0.2 kg and keep on increasing 0.2 kg, 0.2 kg. You can make the formula in just two minutes when you have a piece of paper and pen. Now, what is the starting point? The starting point is when the circumference is 35, at that point put a dot. So 35 AC is 3.5 kg. Keep on increasing 1 cm, keep on decreasing 1 cm, keep on increasing 0.2 kg, keep on decreasing 0.2 kg. You can make this formula yourself. What about OOD, that is outer ocular diameter? Within normal limits, small and large. Hypotelorism, hypertelorism, and underlying chromosomal abnormality. Let me give you a beautiful slide. You know, this, what lecture I'm giving is not in your books. This is the white here, which is a speaking on the dais. So, and when I met Dr. Durisabi this morning, I said, we are sailing in the same boat. So, uh, you take the circumference of the orbit and you put a circumference of the same size in the center. If it fits in, there is no hypotelorism, there is no hypertelorism. If there is an overlapping or there is a space, either you are dealing with hypotelorism or hyper. Now let's give you the answer. This is the colors I have removed. The other formula which is very interesting is whatever the OOD, outer ocular diameter multiplied by 6 will give you the gestational age. If the BPD gestational age and OOD gestational age correspond, and here is another orbit, and look at, if I take the circumference of this and I take the circumference, if I try to fit the same circumference in the center, it will not fit. If it does not fit, we are dealing with hypotelorism. This is a ready reference formula. You don't need any other thing. You can make up your mind. This is hypotelorism. Underlying chromosome like abnormal. Go 20 times. You can make these formula yourself, but you have to read the book 20 times. Nobody reads. Everybody wants pakki pakai ninja. So, what I came to the conclusion was, nuchal fold, cisterna, magna, atrium of the lateral ventricle and fetal hydronephrosis all plug together. Between 25 to 30 weeks, the upper limit of, is 0 0.5. Anything beyond that is dilated. 30 to 35 is 0 0.7. So 5, 7, 9 are the upper limits of all these during that stage of 25 to 30, 30 to 35, and 35 to 40. Now let's see that. This is the cisterna magna. We don't include the vermis in that measurement. I have seen people measuring vermis with it. So you have to measure 
at the level where you draw a line and you measure the cisternal magna from here to here, what should be the diagnosis? More than 0 0.5 at 25 to 30 weeks, 30 to 35 weeks, 0 0.7, 35 to 40 weeks, 0 0.9. So here is the cerebellum, the vermis, and we see a cystic dilatation structure, and we see the nuchal fold thickening. If they measure more than 0 0.5, 0 0.7, 0 0.9, we are dealing with dilatation. And remember, this, I'll move the colors also for you later on. This blue one is the vermis. The cerebellum should be rounded when you take the measurement. And these two yellow lines, inner to inner, is the cisterna magna. So let me move that. And you draw a line on the rounded structures of the cerebellum. You don't dip in and you measure from this point to this point. If it is within 0 0.5, 0 0.7, 0 0.9, it's normal. And we have already told you about the nuchal fold thickening, 1.3 centimeters, so I'll skip this. Now I put this slide deliberately. This is the vermis which is absent. So don't measure the cisterna magna from here to here. This is uh, Danny Walker malformation because we see the dilatation of the cisterna magna along with absence of the vermis which is seen very clearly here. We said atrium of the lateral ventricle. Atrium of the lateral ventricle is where the choroid plexus is, where, where the choroid plexus are. So you measure inner to inner. What should be the measurement? 0 0.5, 0 0.7, 0 0.9. These are the upper limits of normal. Anything less than that is normal. Anything more than that is abnormal. So here is uh, the choroid plexus, which also has by chance a cyst. We measure from inner to inner. And if it is more, that's valid. Lateral ventricles in the head within normal limits are large that you already know. I'll skip very fast because I've been asked so many questions when I landed up in this hall this morning, so I want to finish up that as well. Uh, that's lateral ventricles, dilatation. And when we take the lateral ventricle dilatation, we have to see the dangling choroid pluxes, we have to measure the cortex, we have to measure the uh, lateral ventricles. If you see a uh, elongated cystic structure which is the, the um, cavum septum pellicidum. If you see a beautiful elongated means there is no evidence of region, uh, agenesis of corpus callosum. Of course you have to take the long axis view as well but this gives you confidence that there is no problem. Renal pyelectasis or UPJ or chromosomal this is the transverse of the abdomen. You can see the spine shattering. You can see the kidney with pyelectasis, hydronephrosis. How do you measure it? Always take transverse with the spine shattering. That's hydronephrosis or pyelectasis. You measure this point to this point from A to B, and that should not be more than 0 0.5, 0 0.7, 0 0.9, from 25 weeks to 30 weeks, 30 to 35, and 35 to 40. And here is the transverse of the body, that's a spine, you can see pyelectasis, you can see pyelectasis and we measure the, the, uh, in, uh, the AP diameter of that. Third ventricle within normal limits or dilated acuducal stenosis, I've already mentioned that point that we measure, it should not measure more than 0 0.2 centimeters or 2.0 millimeters. And if you see a dental walker cyst where you can't see anything at the back except the fluid collection. Heart size ratio, I was looking through that uh, update on uh, yesterday's beautiful lectures by Dr. Duresami. But since I've already made this presentation, so I'll just pinpoint some of the measurements, but very well delivered lectures yesterday. And I went through all the slides. Thank you very much, Dr. Duresami, for a very nice elaboration. Heart size ratio within normal limits, small or large cardiomyopathy. Two take home points. Number one, get the best four chamber view and look at the three dotted structure of the spine and look at the aorta which should be on the left side. You take the circumference of the heart, you take the circumference of the chest, it should be one third. Means heart is normal. You can measure the individual chambers, 
the left ventricles and the atriums by circumference or by measuring a long axis and I've just colored color that up. There you can see I've removed that color and you can see you can measure at the below the valves, you can measure and see the thickness and of course you can do the circumference both. Heart axis deviation within normal limits, right side or left side, HLHS, right left uh, large ventricle, small right atrium and so on and so forth. How do you do that? First get the beautiful four chamber view of the heart. Take the three dot structures, the spine. This line which you divide the chest into half and half, this line, this dotted line should just, just touch the aorta. It should not go through the aorta and it should not be away from the aorta. That's the bottom line. And then you divide the chest into four quadrants and then you put a dotted line on the intraventricular septum. You measure from this point to this point and this point to this point. If it's same, means 45 degrees axis deviation of the heart. Three vessel view, PA, aorta and SVC. We have this blue is pulmonary artery, red is aorta and yellow is, the formula is very simple. You measure, make sure that you draw a line, a linear line, dotted line of your measurement. All of them should pass through that line and then you measure from here to here, from here to here and here to here. If this is 0.6 or 6.0 millimeter, this should be 0.5 and this should be half of the pulmonary artery. Very quick reference that PA, aorta and SVC are normal. And this is what I went, was talking about. You draw an imaginary dotted line to check the alignment of the PA, aorta and SVC. If they are in alignment, then you measure from inner to inner, inner to inner, inner to inner. Whatever the pulmonary artery, one millimeter less should be the aorta and half of the pulmonary artery should be the SVC. If you see a beautiful uh, fishtail sign, I call it as a fishtail sign, you are dealing with the pulmonary artery because that's a fishtail sign and that is where you draw a line of that. When I was giving this lecture, I must acknowledge Dr. Um, Dr. Fazil sitting here in the audience. I was talking about the hockey sign. That is, if you look at the aorta, that's a Pakistani hockey sign. And I did not know the answer. I said, open hockey sign, I said. And he said, Dr. Musar, why don't you call it ice hockey sign? So this was his invention that this is uh, called ice hockey sign means open hockey or this is the, um, the um, Pakistani hockey sign. So Pakistani hockey sign, what are the things to look for? This is, I've removed the colors. That's pulmonary, uh, that's aortic arch and the ductal arch. This I call it as a bull's horn appearance. What is the bull horn appearance? the superior vena cava, inferior vena cava and the right atrium. When we talk about isomerism and so on and so forth, we take an upside down picture and this is, if you see that both on, that's normal. We take the pulmonary artery, we take the aortic root, all that. That key start point is that you first take the transfers of the body with aorta, with uh, uh, the J-shaped configuration and the stomach and then do the pivoting of the probe to get the four chamber view of the heart. I'll not teach that because we had a beautiful lecture we gave yesterday. And that's a ductal arch. So that's the aorta and the open arm hockey sign, ductal arch. And that's the closed, that's the Pakistani hockey sign. And one thing what is measurement is you take the measurement from the chest to the spine right here and this curve of the arch of the aorta should be in the center. So you measure from here to here, you measure from here to here, 
means that arch of the aorta is coming in the center, means normal aortic arch. And that's again the SVC and IVC. I've done that. I've just upside down that image to make it as a bull's horn appearance. Uh, M mode very nicely, so I'll skip that. M mode has been already taught, so I'll skip renal size. Within normal limits, small or large, agenesis, polycystic kidney, multicystic dysplastic, tumors, hydronephrosis, UPJ. The formula is very simple. Whatever the gestational age add 5 to it, put a dot, becomes the length of the kidney of that fetus. Is to ready reference check that whether the kidney of the fetus is large or is small. So here is the kidney, that's the length of the kidney, and that's a kidney, so I'll skip that. This kidney is echogenic and large, so you take the length, and we know the formula, whatever the gestational age, plus five, put a dot, should be the length of the kidney of that patient. So varies with the gestational age. What about placental thickness? 15 weeks, put a dot, should be 1.5. 30 weeks put a dot, 40 weeks put a dot, plus minus 0 0.7. Why do you want to know? Because we want to diagnose IUGR, PIA, target, incompatibility, high drops, and so on and so forth. How to measure it and what are the tricks of the trade? This is a large placenta, has to be measured perpendicularly, and this is a thin placenta which resulted into a miscarriage. Never add the segmental contraction or mistake the segmental contraction for placenta. This is not placenta. This is the placenta. This is the uterine wall. And look at the uterine wall. It merges. You don't see that hypoechoic at the back because this is segmental contraction which should not be mistaken for placenta. Cord, uh, you can have excessive cord twisting which is something which needs to be followed up. What you do is you measure from this spiral curves from this point to this point and if it is less than 1.5 centimeters means excessive rotation of the cord on its axis which is a bad sign. And if the cord is too much uncoiled, you see straight lines of the artery in the way that's also not good, there is a literature on that. If you see, we always remember Dr. Uh, Imran Rahim at uh, this time, he gave a lecture in Urdu and said that if the eyes are looking at the eyes, it means that everything is fine. And if the eyes are looking at the eyes, and what he meant was, and very closely related to this one, this is the fetus. If you can see the owl's eye, that means the cord is twice around the neck. You try and wall thickness in gravid uterus is an important factor to look for. I am talking of uterine wall thickness in gravid uterus. Normal, thick or thin. 0 0.5 to 1 centimeters is normal. Less than 0 0.3 is something to worry about. What do we mean by that? How many of you measure the uterine wall? Never. I measure in every pregnant lady. So this is the placenta and this is the uterine wall. Let me remove the colors. That's the hypoechoic line. We measure the thickness of the uterine wall, which should be at any time of gestational age, 0 0.5 to 1 centimeters. If it is thinner, are we dealing with a creta and creta per creta? If it is thin, are we dealing with segmental contraction? If we don't see it at all, what's going wrong with that? We can make the diagnosis on this basis that this is intrauterine pregnancy. If you see, you measure the uterine wall all the time. Cerebellar diameter is not my invention, it's Professor Stuart Campbell of Royal College. Uh, those of you know his name, I have heard his name. He was the uh, obstetrician of Lady Diana in, way back in 1982. 
and he did teach us when I was in America at that time. So he came up with this uh, formula and what did he say? Whatever the measurement remove the dot becomes a gestational age. So if 2.2 centimeters setting better, if the cerebellum are rounded, high quick weight, then you measure and that's 22 weeks and 32 weeks. So here is the cerebellum rounded and measure from outer to outer, whatever the measurement, remove the dot, that's gestational age, ready reference formula. So here is rounded, high O equate, it should not be banana shaped and so on and so forth. And there is, now we talk about a little bit about AFI very quickly, increase or decrease, 9 to 19 is normal. I beg to disagree with Phelan's classification because I did a lot of work on that. What is slightly increased, what is decreased, we will come to that point. 14 plus minus 5 is the normal range. So when you minus, 14 minus 5 is 9, 14 plus 5 is 19, so 9 to 9, 19 is the normal range. When you reduce 3 centimeters from 6 to 9, slightly decrease, reduce 3, 3 to 6, moderately decrease, less than 3 is moderately decrease. I'll not go into my research work at this time because uh, of the time constraint, this is increase and so on and so forth. Why do we want to make the diagnosis? Because we are picking up abnormalities because of decrease or increase in amniotic fluid. And that's increase in amniotic fluid, that's increase in amniotic fluid. And these are the problems we deal with, decrease in amniotic fluid. And the best way to do that is a panoramic scan, with, which shows this is the head, this is the stomach, that's the placenta, and that's the heart, and there's no amniotic fluid in any pocket whatsoever. When the amniotic fluid becomes echogenic, as echogenic, so much so that we can see the umbilical cord floating within it, we are dealing with black amniotic fluid. Because we have got red amniotic fluid, we have got green amniotic fluid, we have got white amniotic fluid, and we have got black amniotic fluid. I've delivered two patients because I did two years of my post-graduation in obstetrics and gynecology. The amniotic fluid came out was black. The color which you're wearing black because the meconium stain lighter left for a longer time the fetus never survived if it's a black amniotic fluid. And that's amniotic fluid. Eye boiling technique is important in AFI. That's very important. That's how you do the measurements. Survival length, a word of caution, within normal limits or small, incompetent. I give 100% marks to Harris Frenberg of the United States who made this observation that cervix is a box shaped structure before you measure the length, make sure the AP diameter and the length is both measured because if the bladder is full, you report it normal and you report previa. When you take the not when you empty the bladder, the cervical length reduces and it becomes no previa. What was his theory? Whatever the length and whatever the length makes a beautiful box shaped structure of the cervix and that's the cervix. So there is uh, the bottom line is 10 percentile, which is 2.6 centimeters. We all know that cervix is a dynamic structure. In the beginning, it's small, it grows, and then we have to evaluate the length. A Michael cord Doppler 432, I crisscross this image, watch my hand, and 2, it should be 2, 4, it should be 4, 3, it should remain 3. Uh, when we talk about IUGR, we have to start with placental insufficiency between 3 and 5. If it is more than 5, less than 7, we use question mark IUGR. More than 7, less than 12, we use mild IUGR. When there is no diastolic, moderate and reversal, severe. And what about the middle cerebral artery? This is the most important factor. If you don't find umbilical cord doctor abnormal, go to the next stage, MCA. I've seen patients, severe IUGR, 
and the doctor of the umbilical cord was normal. MCA, this figure you have to remember, this is the range for 30 weeks and 35 weeks. What you have to remember is the figure does not go below this. Any figure going below this, we are dealing with IUGR. But you give a margin like 0 0.7, 0 0.80 to 0.70, it's okay, but it is 0 0.60 at this stage, it is IUGR. And of course, uh, ductus venosus has to be measured, and we can see that upside down. I will not go into the detail. Very important. Every time you do the ultrasound, this is for benefit of every one of us. Always measure the thickness of the anterior abdominal wall of the mother. If it is less than one centimeter thickness, good resolution, one to three average, and more than three, very poor resolution. At my center, I always report the thickness because I tell the clinician I got a very poor image, I cannot do justification of saying NP is normal or abnormal because the, the thickness of the anterior abdominal wall, start doing it and you know what we mean. Those who are obstetricians, they will know that okay, anterior abdominal wall, rubbery type of it and you cannot even feel the head in that way. Uterus size 4.5, 8.5 into 4.5, 4.7 is normal. Anything less than that, we are dealing with a small uterus. Anything more than that, we are dealing with a large uterus. The length depends on how many children she has. But the AP diameter more than 5 is something to worry about. Endometrial canal thickness. Within normal limits, thin or thick. Less than 0 0.5 is normal, 1 plus minus 0 0.3 is the range. Anything 0 0.7 to 1.3 is normal. Anything less than that, less than more than that is abnormal. Word of caution. When you have a dominant follicle 1.8 into 1.8 mean diameter follicle which you think is going to rupture, what should be the bottom line of the endometrial canal? 0.8 centimeters. In the past, we have been using 0.6, which is not correct anymore. 0.8 should match with the 1.8. And when it is more than 1.5. Now, what about the ovarian volume? 8 centimeters cube and less is okay, normal is less. 8 to 12 is equivocal, that means there, is a, there may be a problem, there may not be a problem, but any ovary which is beyond 12 is a large ovary. What about the follicles? Entral count is 0 0.3 to 0 0.5. Follicles in the PCO should be 0 0.5 to 0 0.9. Mature follicle range is 2.3 plus minus 5. They are plus minus 0 0.5. Do it yourself. 2.3 minus 0 0.5 is 1.8. 2.3 plus 0 0.5, 2.8. Anything mean diameter between 1.8 to 2.8 will rupture. That's a normal follicle. What is the definition of follicular retention cyst or a follicular cyst? 3 to 5. Anything which goes beyond is a large ovarian cyst. A word of caution, when you see a large follicle, is this follicle going to rupture? When it is going to rupture? Can I go for intercourse or whatever or IUI or... You make a, a circumference of the ovary, the edges, and if the follicle is abutting out of that circumference, this follicle will rupture in next six hours, within six hours. And that's a follicle which is right here. And if the follicle stays, it becomes a follicle retention cyst. Retention cyst definition is 3 to 5, ovarian cyst 5 to 7, and ovarian cyst bigger than 7 needs to be aspirated. 
if you see a thick endometrial canal and you see a follicle, the patient comes to you and say, I think I'm pregnant. You're not going to write follicles. You're going to write corpus luteum because the canal is thick and repeat ultrasound after one week. All sitting here in the audience, including myself, will say a beautiful follicle, a word of caution. So look at this picture. That was not a follicle. That was a dilated ureter. Dilated ureter can mimic like a beautiful follicle. But a push or a that's follicle mana. And that's a retention cyst. And I'm almost about to die. The central stroma drifts the follicle to the periphery and that gives the pearl necklace appearance of PCO. Central stroma to low parthene. And that's the central stroma. It is the central stroma more important. Size is number two and follicles number three. These are the three parameters which should be taken into PCO. So the central stroma should be more than 50% of the wedding volume. The pink line is the volume of the ovary. The blue line is the volume of the stroma. You get numbers. When you, you trace, you get number. If this number is 60 and this is 100, that means this is overshooting 50%. That is what drifts the follicles to the periphery and make the diagnosis. There are five great virtues in life. If you want to go to Jannah, Jannat. Faith in unknown is very important. And I'm in the land of Sufis and the saints, so I, have, I, have, I think it's a proper slide. Thankful heart is the biggest virtue. Helping attitude. Think about it, praying tongue and service to humanity. All doctors, by doing their job, they are doing service to humanity. So that's what it is. In the end, my favorite slide, give to the world the best you have and the best will come back to you. Thank you very much. Metal is uh, complete on a single ovary. Will it meet the criteria of a polycystic ovary syndrome? Yes. Uh, even if it's one ovary following these three criteria, which means volume more than 12, follicles at the periphery between 0 0.5 to 0 0.9, more than 5, they can be 10, 12, 14, no problem and the central stroma is more than 50%, even if it's one ovary, it's PCO. Thank you very much. For uh, placenta, preta, uh, increta, percreta, will you kindly elaborate? Okay, the starting point of accreta, increta, percreta, you must know the history of the patient. Number one, many DNCs, more cesarean section. Number two, is the placenta low line? covering the os. And number three, lakes and flakes in the placenta. And number four, absence of the uterine wall th thickness, which I just said 0 0.5 to 1 centimeters, when it thins out. And the last point is the color doctor that you see flow, which are invading into the placenta. And the lakes are filled with venous flow. Thank you very much, sir. You're welcome. Any other question, please? Thank you, sir. Thank you. If the placenta has not no lying, means it is an anterior location and many lakes are there. What are the clinical importance of lakes? Uh, as I said, the criteria which I just said, if you meet that criteria 100%, you have more confidence in saying that it is a creature and creature for creature. But if that criteria is not met, then there is an ambiguity. 
And there, my important importance would be on the thickness of the uterine wall, number one, that if it is thin or not visualized, and number two would be the penetration of the vessels and filling of the vacuoles with the fluid. Then I will say it is a creature. Is there any clinical importance of increased placental thickness? Uh, that I just mentioned that if you have a thick placenta, you are dealing with uh, diabetes, RH incompatibility, or maybe underlying chromosomal abnormality. There are certain drugs like indomethacine, which has got adverse effect on the placenta, and that may thick placenta may be an underlying uh, cause for even chromosomal abnormality. So thick placenta, if you have excluded segmental contraction then you have to take it seriously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.